Now, I'm going to be a Will Parker. That's what I'm going to be. I'm the character actor. So instead of being like the lead, you know, I'm not going to be Gaston or the Beast in Beauty and the Beast. I'm going to be the candlestick guy or I'm going to be the clock or I'm going to be one of those people. And as soon as I learned that about myself and not only learned it, but then accepted it, I became so good because not to be an imposter of a lot of people we get hung up on, we are trying to dictate everything that people see us as. When there's some things that are just authentically us that come through that we have no control over, that people see, that often they're having their moment of seeing us who they see us as, but that doesn't connect with who we want them to see us as, but we have no control over that one. And so I feel like everybody's totally confused yet, so am I. <laughs> okay. You're listening to The Creative Imposter, episode number 72. Welcome to The Creative Imposter. I'm Andrea Klunder, your host, and I have a confession. I have been thinking about today's guest for two years. Ever since my first podcast movement conference in Chicago, when he hosted the PMX Talks before the official start of the conference, I thought Matt Marr was hilarious, welcoming the best of all possible MCs, and it really kicked off the start of my conference on the right note. Matt Marr is the producer and host of The Dear Maddie Show, actor, narrative therapist, show host, self-proclaimed chatterbox, and I personally love that he always calls me sugar. I mean, he calls everyone else sugar, too. In fact, that's how he starts his shows is something like, hello, sugars, or something like that. I don't know. It's much cuter when he does it. But I like to think he's talking just to me. In our conversation here on The Creative Imposter, we get real about life, business, and money as a creative professional. And though he is hilarious, it's not all jokes. We go deep into imposter syndrome, not only as relates to being a creative entrepreneur, but also as relates to identity, orientation, and self-love. I don't have to sell you too much on this episode because you're already listening, but I do want to suggest that if after the next 45 minutes together, you cannot get enough of Matt and Andrea, head over to The Dear Maddie Show because his interview with me is there waiting for you. At least I think it is. That was the plan anyway. On The Dear Maddie Show, we talk about totally different but related things. So it's not like you'll be hearing the same thing twice, including our shared background in classical voice training and opera, how we ventured away from that, and how what we do now as podcasters is relevant to that initial passion and actual identity. In fact, funny story, after we got off Skype on that interview, I tuned into my friend and fellow podcaster, Tina Conroy of the Intuitive Woman podcast. Tina has a weekly Facebook Live on Fridays where she pulls oracle cards for whoever tunes in and requests one. I asked, what do I need to call into my life right now? And Tina pulled a fairy card called Make Music. Ha! Huh. Right after Matt and I were just talking about being music majors and voice and podcasting and, well, yeah, the thought I had right after that card pull was something that I had danced around in my interview with Matt, but I don't think I actually said it, which was when I was feeling depressed about closing my yoga business and being bankrupt and losing my identity as yoga studio owner or entrepreneur, You've heard that story, right? I've talked about it here on the show. When I was down at my lowest, I started the Creative Imposter podcast because it felt like the only thing I wanted to do or could bring myself to do. But what happened after that was that in time, podcasting actually gave me my voice and ultimately my whole identity back. And it felt and still feels more authentically like me than the old identities ever did in the first place. Isn't that always the way? You think of exactly what you were trying to say right after the moment has passed. So I just wanted to put that out there, that that's a lot of what we're talking about on The Dear Maddie Show. 
Anyway, to hear how that all played out and what that has to do with you as a multi-passionate creative person, go to DearMaddieShow.com. That's Maddie with two T's and an I-E. The link, of course, will be in the show notes for you for this episode at TheCreativeImposter.com forward slash 072. Okay, enough of me channeling my inner chatterbox. Here's Matt Marr. Matt Marr, thank you so much for joining me on The Creative Imposter. Is it weird if I say that I've been thinking about having you on my show since podcast movement in Chicago two years ago? (laughs) No, that's not. That seems like a lifetime ago. I can't believe it's happening again so quickly. I know. There's going to be a certain point in time where I start marking the years by podcast movements. You know, like when you're in school, you mark it by like, oh, that was junior year or that was freshman year and you might do the math to think about the actual year i'm gonna start doing that with podcast movements like oh that was philadelphia year (laughs) i'm right there with you girl yes exactly (laughs) so for those of my listeners who have not been thinking about you for two years (laughs) (laughs) i always like to be thought of man woman i don't care tell us a little bit about who you are what you do and what you're most excited about in your life or work right now So my name is Matt Marr, and a lot of people call me Maddie. My podcast is called The Dear Maddie Show. Well, one of them is called The Dear Maddie Show. My master's is in clinical psychology, but I'm also a stand-up comedian and an actor and a comic. So Dear Maddie is kind of the combination of all those things. It's like, Dear Abby with your gay best friend, hopefully, with a little Southern sass. So that's kind of what the show is. And I just started it because, honestly, I've always dreamed of having a platform where people talk about issues. And I went, well, screw it. I'm just going to do it in my living room. And so I did. It's been such a labor of love. That's, I mean, it's just, I feel like it's at the core of where my heart is creatively. So with that, I'm, you know, I'm actually not to just bring up podcast movement, but where I am now, because I just talked about how much I love my podcast. And I feel like what I'm doing podcasting right now is a little, everything feels stale to me. (sighs) And I'm just ready to be re-inspired and re and kind of re-energized and have new ideas for my show and new people. That's what I'm kind of really looking forward and charged up right now is podcast movement because I know it's going to be that type of experience because it always is. So my show always changes in some way after a podcast movement. You're so right when you talked about the year. It almost like I feel like as artists, as creative, we're always having to like recommit. And it's almost like when work, I've I kind of realized that when I'm when working a lot with people struggling with addiction, it's like you have to recommit that you want to, you know, be sober. But it's also like as an artist, you have to recommit that you want to be vulnerable. You want to recommit that you have to put yourself out there and not know what's going to happen and recommit that you're going to make that little gif or whatever that you're going to put on Twitter, even though you hate marketing yourself, (laughs) but you just recommit to those things. So I kind of really am looking because I felt I've just felt a little other artistic stuff that I'm doing is taking a lot of focus right now, some theater and I'm a producer. And so we're selling some shows right now. So that's taking a lot of my focus. So I feel like I'm ready to kind of bring my attention to podcasting and be re-inspired by it. So how long have you been podcasting? You know, I think I should know the day. You know what? Actually, it's going to be when I'm at Podcast Movement. At Podcast Movement, it will be my four, I think it's four year anniversary of Dear Maddie. Wow. Yeah, Dear Maddie. Yeah, July 27th will be four years. And I'm about 130 shows in. Mm. But then I also have another podcast with a friend called TV Tea Time. It's totally different. It's like my gay best friend. We're like sisters and we watch like Riverdale on the CW and recap it and so that's a whole comedy and thing like that. But um, but yeah. I have to say that I, this is a total tangent, but my partner laughs at me every time he catches me watching a CW show. And uh, <laughs> I'm with and you. Riverdale, I didn't start watching that one until the first season was already on Netflix. So very that's how late. the show became that's how the show became popular. Actually, people binged it on Netflix. Yeah. And I loved the first season. And then the second season started so, and I was watching it and I'm like, uh, what happened? <laughs> well, if people want to know our opinion, you can listen to TV Tea Time. But it literally we said as if they were trying to get the show denied for a second it's horrible but apparently now there's going to be like a cabaret bar in the bottom of pops now in the basement so i feel like it's going to get a lot more gay with just singing and show tunes which we're all about we just want singing show tunes and shirtless archie and reggie that's kind of all we want it's kind of the best parts of this show hilarious 
Going back to all the things that you said, so it's hard to follow, Matt, because you have a podcast, you do therapy, you do theater. Make a list of all the areas that you have your your fingers in. I have gay DD. (laughs) I have gay DD. That's what I I always say that. I do. I do. I do. So my brother's the same way. But yeah, so it's producing, podcasting, therapy. And therapy is now, I do some clients in coaching. A lot of therapy has turned more into about three years ago. I started a summer camp for LGBT youth. Mm -hmm. I'm not a director of that anymore, but I still am a super active volunteer. It's called Brave Trails. It's, again, it's leadership camp for queer youth ages 12 to 18. So I do a lot with, like, this weekend we're moving camp up to where camp is because camp's starting in a week and a half. So that's a lot where my therapy focus goes. Now, my therapy focus is either used in Dear Maddie working kind of with, in clients on air or it's more working with LGBTQ youth and that spectrum and that community work. And so, so you've yeah. been kind of, like, shifting in and out of different interests. And I think that's where the commitment thing comes in because I know that I – have the same tendency where it's like, if I haven't talked to somebody in a while, they'll say, Oh, how's yoga going? And I'm like, Oh, I'm not really teaching yoga that much anymore. Or they'll just say, Yeah. Oh, how's theater going? And I'm like, Oh, I haven't really done theater in a year. <laughs> you know, I had one person who is one of those situations. Where I don't mind people giving me their advice, but I always, this is something I've learned as a therapist. If somebody's not asking you for advice, don't give it Mm. because you don't know if they're ready to receive it. I do a little bit of hosting on this kind of web channel. She was just kind of aggressively laid into me. She's like, you just really need to choose one thing and that's what you need to do. And that's who you are. And you just need to give that a hundred percent because you're getting everything 20%. And I understand that ideology. And she was kind of giving me some tough love. And at the same time, I've lived in LA for 14 years. I'm originally from Oklahoma, Southern Oklahoma and North Texas area, but I've only really kind of been committed to like really fleshing out because I moved here and I just had come out and I was kind of figuring things out and didn't know who I was. Oddly enough, I didn't start the entertainment stuff more until after I thought I was going to be a therapist and that was it. And I got my master's and I was on that track and then entertainment stuff kind of started to find me. And then I realized I can combine both of these things into what I love. So I've really been only at it about five years, but that said, it's like, I just live in a town where you can say, you know, I want to be an actor and I want to be a film actor and that's what I want to do. And you can work as hard as you can at it. You can go for as, and do it all a thousand percent and do that one thing of being an actor. The only problem with that is, is that there's so many factors that are beyond you that have nothing to do with your talent, that have nothing to do with your work ethic, that are a lot of other people giving you permission to open the door to even attempt to be able to do the thing. And so I feel like when you live in LA, especially, or you're in the entertainment business, I feel like... You, yes, it's not, you don't want to be spread too thin, but I think it's important to do what you're passionate about and also try to find some, I, that's why I encourage a lot of actors and creatives to have a podcast because it's so, like I talked about Dear Maddie, no one has to say yes. If I say, I want to do a show about white privilege or I want to do a show about Black Lives Matter, I don't have to get approval from somebody. I don't have to talk. I can just think of the show, produce it out figure out what I want to do, and then I put it up, and it's out there. I feel like as creatives, when we feel like we're not doing anything is when we feel, honestly, I think when we've never completed anything, Mm -hmm. because creatives start things and never finish, and I'm prone to that as well. So that's with with podcasting, it kind of is a centering thing for me that it it allows closure in case, you know, because I do commercial acting. Well, I haven't booked a commercial in a year and a half. I have no control over that. Mm -hmm. It's just people aren't looking for my type in commercials right now, whereas Two years ago, I was booking five nationals a year. Mm -hmm. So you can't do anything about that. And so that was a good lesson for me to to not have too many interests, not let the gay DD go crazy, but at least be inspired to go in other areas. That's kind of how I do it. Maybe it's wrong. Maybe I should just do one thing, but I can't do that. No, I think that you, first of all, you're speaking my language because I had received the exact same advice many years ago and it made me so furious, which is like, you know, you're kind of successful at these things. But if you would just focus on one thing, you could really be successful. And I just, uh, <laughs> you know, like that was it's not just, advice just, that was productive for no. me. 
It's not. I mean, if you're my boyfriend does real estate and for him, yes, he wants to do real estate and he is focused on that a thousand percent. And that really is panning out for him. But it's different when you're in a creative field. And I love like what you said about the whole gatekeeper thing, because that is something that, you know, I grew up doing theater and originally went to college to study vocal music and was doing opera training. Oh, yeah. we Because I forgot. That's why we both did that. <laughs> yeah, we both Girl, did that. We can sing. Let's sing. No, no we, don't have to. we don't have to sing. And so I did that. And then, you know, I did theater. And then I got into I ended up graduating with a degree in broadcast communication. And so all of these things are sort of related to what I do now. But in all of those cases, you have to put yourself out there and pitch something and somebody says yes or no, or you hear crickets and that's also no. And there's these walls that you have to kind of like scale to get into the garden. And then where media is right now and the way that things are like having your own show, like, yes, you do still need to do the work and put yourself out there and promote it. Otherwise, no one's going to find it. No one's going to listen to it. But you have so much more freedom and flexibility and control that you can get that satisfaction and that sense of, I think you said completion. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because it's just, I think a perfect example of that is, is I have so many actor friends, female actors, especially, that are white women that are blonde. <laughs> they're not working right now in Hollywood. No, and no. they're like, I'm not angry about it. They're like, I'm so glad that diversity is finally happening in films. It's wonderful. And this is needed. But the downside to that is, is that, you know, we're not really getting a lot of work right now because there, people are looking for diversity. And that's incredible. You know, one of my good friends is an Indian American woman that's going to be, she she's gonna, has a new NBC show next year that's all like she's the main character. That would never have happened for her five years ago. So we recognize that. But to me, I look at that as, well, don't be bitter about it. Be happy for those people. Don't be upset, but realize it's bigger than you. And so what can you do for yourself to just feel like you're being a creative artist and, you know, and hopefully try to make money doing something else, you know, it's just beyond you. How do you make money right now? I know you said you're not doing, you haven't booked a commercial in a while and you aren't doing a ton of therapy clients. Mm -hmm. So how are you making your money? Well, on Santa Monica Boulevard on late nights around 1230 a.m., you'll find. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I was like, where's this going? I'm like, like, it's LA. It could be anything. <laughs> it could be anything. So luckily through commercial residuals, I still bring some money in from mm-hmm. that. And then I mentioned my boyfriend does real estate. I also I still work part time, actually, at a law office. I uh, worked there for years and years and years full time. So I do that. Working on a theater project that, you know, I did some theater projects here and there that I'll make a little money from. But really kind of in those kind of like just little sources, I have a little bit of and I'm trying to build it more just whenever I was lucky enough to be on a couple of game shows, just been living in L.A. And so I took a, a bit of that money and I used it to buy some rental properties in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. where I'm from. Mm-hmm. Because my father owns a lot already. My aunt's a realtor. My father does construction. So it was kind of like perfect for me. And really, that just kind of showed me the power of real estate, really, and passive income, kind of mailbox money. Because I don't make a ton of money from that month, you know, but it's an, it's enough to like, if it's a month where I'm like, ooh, this is going to be tough to pay my rent, I can, you know, dip into that and use that money. And it's been very helpful. So that's something as money comes in and when I get commercial money or if I have kind of financial, that's the thing with being in the entertainment industry. It's so crazy that a lot of artists, actors, or, or especially, it's a generalization, but I think it's true just because you're not, you're not thinking that. But a lot of them I know, I've talked about, they're not great with money. But you have to learn to be so efficient with money because you might make $100,000 one year and the next year you might make twenty. So the next time I have a financial windfall like that, with I'm definitely just wanting to put it into more real estate. So then hopefully I'm not having to work any part-time job and I can really kind of do what I want and I just have rental property. That's the goal. I ask that not to be nosy about your finances or anything, but just because I know that. No, I love that conversation because no one talks about that. Exactly. And I know that I have a lot of listeners who are creatives who have the nine to five day job and have the fantasy about entrepreneurship, right? The fantasy of walking out of that nine to five and following their creative passion and having a business around, you know, making art or performing or writing or whatever. 
And I definitely grew up with those kinds of fantasies. And I I know that when I was working my nine to five at the Lyric Opera, actually doing production and admin work, not singing. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I was like, oh, I'm I'm just doing this until I get my big break. Well, your big break, huh? What? That's not... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's not like yeah. a plan. And I think it is surprising sometimes to look at somebody who, if you just looked on the surface, here's Matt Marr. He's this really successful podcaster. He has this talk show and he's an actor and comedian. And to drill down into what's going on behind the scenes that we don't necessarily see, or it's not the exactly. glamorous part, but that makes it a reality instead of just a fantasy. I appreciate that you asked it because it's something I try to bring up more now because at first I would have other friends say, you don't need to ever say that you still work part time in a law office. You don't need to ever say that. Mm -hmm. And because people will then think of you as that. And I'm like, really? Because it's not like I'm on my Instagram saying, hey, I'm I'm filing something with the court right now. (laughs) You know, I'm not. That's not how I'm promoting myself. But it's also, too, I think that. You know, I'll interview people as well, and they'll they'll pitch themselves as a, it's all smoke and mirrors as a total entrepreneur, and then you find out, and they're like, "Well, I gotta go. I've got my day job," and I think, but you don't talk about that and promote yourself that way at all. So I feel like it's just important, I think, for especially with podcasters, is that my listeners trust me and. I want to be honest and authentic with them because I feel like they are with me. I mean, they're, they're writing, some of them are writing me silly, funny questions to answer. Like, you know, my husband won't shave his pubic hair. What do I do? But a lot of them are writing very, like, I'm in a hard place in my life and I am stuck. And what do I do with this? And, and a lot of them do write about job stuff. And so I feel like if I'm just saying, hey, I'm making all my living, you know, I feel like that's false. I do have some podcaster friends that, They think, I don't feel like I'm ready for it yet. And maybe it's my own kind of, whether it's doubt or whatever. But I have some friends that tell me I need to step up like my podcast stuff and start either trying to reach out for sponsors or do a Patreon or something like that, which I'm fine with doing. But I don't know. There's a part of me that's holding back. I don't feel like I'm ready for that yet. I still kind of want to let my show grow without that. But we'll see. That's something I, I could probably start looking into doing. It's just, I don't know. I love it so much. You know how sometimes things can get tainted when Mm. then you're making money from it? I was just going to say that. And so it's hard for me because I love it so much. But then also, but my friends said, but yeah, they said, but think of it this way. If you're able to make money from doing your podcast and you love it so much, then you're able to pour more love into your, into the show you're making. And I thought, well, that's a good point too. So I don't know. I'm on the fence on that one. Yeah. I think that's a fine line. I think you have to be so careful and... I know that I have a tendency that if I'm doing something that I really love and I enjoy it and it's creative and then I put pressure on it to fund my life and to make me money, then it can quickly suck a lot of that joy out of it. Yes, yes, well put. (laughs) And then the other thing is that, do you, you know Jen Briney, right, from Congressional Dish? Oh, yeah. You've been on Congressional Dish. I love Jim Brownie. She's been on my show. I've been on her show. But I mean, I just always think about with her listener supported model and and how hard she works to keep that model going. Like that is a lot of work that she pours into it making is. sure that her show is fully listener supported and then that she doesn't have to take sponsors because that also muddies the, the interests like being a political show. And I think mm-hmm. that You just have to be so careful with that money thing with your show. And I kind of like to protect this show as like my little my little baby. And I don't want any (laughs) outside things tainting it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that is a beauty with Patreon that you are being listener supported there. You know, you're just putting out more content for them. So it's not so much an ad thing. And then with Jen Briney, too, I think that girl has to spend so much time just reading all that stuff. She Mm -hmm. has to spend so much time before she preps a show. Yeah. I mean, I have to do a little bit, but nothing like that. Totally. Yeah, it's a different kind of creation that she's making. I created a Patreon and I have not, <laughs> this is not a uh, shameless plug for my Patreon, but I have not received any contributions yet on that. So I haven't put a ton of effort into it, but it's been there. I've mentioned it. I put links to it. I've tried to come up with cool, creative things and I just haven't been able to get it going. So that's mm. that's another one of those mysteries to me. <laughs> Yeah, they are not there. Yeah, you're farther along than me then. <laughs> so, you know, of course, this is the creative imposter. And we've been talking all about creativity and following your passions and making it all work in a practical sense in real life. And you have the perspective from a few different angles. When you think about imposter syndrome, how does that resonate for you? Or how does that come up for you, if ever? 
When I think of imposter, so I, I don't do as much anymore just because of time, but I used to teach classes for actors, creative types here in L.A., because I really love auditioning, and I feel like as an actor, you have to be in that place where you love auditioning. And if you don't, you got to get out of the business because that's 90% of what you're doing. You know from singing up, but that is in theater, that is what you're doing and what and you're I working on. I hated auditioning. So. <laughs> and I don't think then it's probably right. You know, you really have mm-hmm. to get to that point. And I was able to do that. And I think a lot of that was for, I'm able to kind of be myself in all aspects of my life for the most part, and that doesn't change. But what I would teach in my class when it gets, gets to imposter syndrome is I was watching once an Oprah Winfrey episode, which I'm a self-described Oprah fan, as many people know. Mm-hmm. And this is years ago. And so she was interviewing Kenny Rogers. And Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton were both on. And people, if you don't know who those people are, where the hell have you been? And, and, um, <laughs> it means they're 22. <laughs> it means they're 22. But even then, they know Dolly Parton. But anyway, Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton, for some of you who don't know, they sang that song Islands in the Stream and the du- other duets. And they were hugely popular from like the early 80s. And they were lifelong friends or still are. And so Oprah asked Kenny Rogers, she said, why do you think Dolly Parton has this appeal that just everyone loves her? Like there's not anyone who doesn't love her. How do you think she accomplishes that? What is it about her? And Kenny Rogers said, which I thought was so interesting, he said, you know, I really feel like when we're born and we're put on this earth, that we're almost split into three parts. There's three parts of ourselves. There's the person we really are. There's the person people think we are. And then there's the person that we want people to see us as. And he said, I feel like our job in life is to try to make those three aspects of ourselves come together as closely as possible so that way you never see the seam of any divide of any three of those parts. And he said, Dolly Parton, more than anybody I've ever met in my life, she is those three things all encompassed in one always. And I think people see that. And so what I think that gets to the truth of is really knowing who you are and being who you are in all aspects of your life. And so for actor, that's a lot of, you might think, I remember when I was studying music at North Texas, thinking, I want to be, you know, curly in Oklahoma. (laughs) And realizing that now that I know, it's again, so that's how I saw myself. But when you're able to watch tape and you listen to you, you go, you know, my voice doesn't sound like the way curly would sound. Hello, I'm like, this like effeminate, like character, actor, comedy guy, I'm never going to be that. Now, I'm going to be a Will Parker. That's what I'm going to be. I'm the character actor. So instead of being like the lead, you know, I'm not going to be Gaston or the Beast in Beauty and the Beast. I'm going to be the candlestick guy (laughs) or I'm going to be the clock or I'm going to be one of those people. And as soon as I learned that about myself and not only learned it, but then accepted it, I became so... Good, Because I remember what happened is I was cast in college on Funny Thing Happened to the Way to the Forum. And everybody said, you should be pseudolist. You should be pseudolist. And honestly, I think I probably could have been a pretty good pseudolist because I'm not a bad actor. But I was cast as Hysterium, which is like the much more effeminate, like kind of really crazy character. And honestly, like look back on it, I stole the show because it was a part that lined up kind of all three of those aspects of myself. So I think it's a lot of times working with creative, not to be an imposter of a lot of people we get hung up on. We are trying to dictate everything that people see us as when there's some things that are just authentically us that come through that we have no control over that people see that often they're having their moment of seeing us who they see us as but that doesn't connect with who we want them to see us as but we have no control over that one and so i feel like everybody's totally confused yet so am i okay <laughs> But I think there's that that's where that imposter comes in. And luckily for me, when we're trying to be something we're not and luck that, you know, that happened in music and then, you know, that as being very gay and dealing in Oklahoma and Texas and all that, a lot of evangelical kind of guilt with all that and trying to pray the gay away and all that. That again, that, that comes on a deeper level of really accepting who I am and loving that person and wanting to wanting to hang around and be with the person that I really am and not try to change that because I see that so much. I think women are more comfortable themselves, at least the ones I know, but a lot of gay men especially, that they are fighting against this. We're still in this culture of hyper-masculine men and there's kind of this hatred of femininity on the women's side and the femininity in men, you know, it, it, that's a whole other conversation. But I see a lot of gay men that, again, 
are trying to be those imposters and trying to, you know, butch it up or trying to be a manly man or a manly gay man and not be effeminate. And that is so contrary to some of them to who they are. And you can see that pain. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a long answer, sugar. No, that was perfect. That was really good. Because I think that a lot of the interviews that I have on this show and conversations that I have on the show, we talk very much in the framework of work and of imposter syndrome in your creative output. So whether that's your paid work in your job, or whether that's your passion or your creative hobby, or whatever it is, but taking it and even thinking about your identity in terms of who you actually are in your day to day life, and even in terms of your sexuality and your orientation and how you sort of fit into society compared to society's, you know, ideals of what you should be or how you should come across Mm -hmm. or what does the successful person look like or even I just feel like there is so much pressure to fit into these certain roles. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you talked about coming to accept yourself and love yourself and be really confident just being you and not trying to live up to some kind of like preconceived standard of identity. What kinds of work do you do for yourself to keep nurturing that? Or if something kind of shakes you or rattles you a little bit around identity or around authenticity, what kinds of things or resources do you have in your life to get you back on confident, self-assured, I know who I am, I'm confident in my identity track. I have probably the first person I think, I have a very good friend, her name is Tia. She was on an episode of my podcast because she's a meditation teacher and she does, I mean, yoga. And and we talk a lot about meditation on that episode, which is cool because she has a very different concept. It's not about clearing your mind for her, so which was good because I could never clear my mind. So (laughs) it was kind of the first time meditation ever clicked for me. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's an episode that's on the people can find. But for me, it's just a good friend. It's just, and I think that's so important that we have the support of people whether it's family of origin or your family of choice, your chosen family. And, you know, she is somebody, I'm the godfather to her children. She is chosen family for me and my own family because I am close to my own family too. I think it's just important to have those relationships with those people because I feel like, you know, let's say I had a show that blew up and I became super famous or whatever. I don't think any of those people would treat me differently. I might try to treat them differently if I, my ego gets involved, but I don't think they would let me. And so having those kind of hashtag truth talk friends mm-hmm. that really keep you honest. So for me, that's, that's a big thing. And I mean, that's probably the biggest thing. And my partner and my boyfriend as well it does that. And then I think something that's helped me a lot with imposter, I mean, I'm sure people probably mentioned on your show before I talk about a lot, but I'm a huge fan of the artist way. If nobody's ever done that, have you, you've done that or have you? I've started it and abandoned it many times. Oh, me too. Me too. But even <laughs> I've only gotten it through it once and I've tried done it like five other times, but I kind of take it as if I get to week five and that's where I stop. Oh, well. Mm-hmm. It helped whatever it helped. But I recommend that for a lot of people that aren't even quote unquote artists, mm-hmm. because the artist way is so much about really kind of getting you focused on what is your passion and how you can funnel that into something not only creative, but also something that people want to want to buy or want to listen to or want to enjoy. And so that's helpful for me. And then, I mean, obviously I do try to do things, you know, like the normal things like working out and meditation and stuff like that. But I really think it's probably either friends or, you know, I, the more and more I realize if I'm feeling off kilter and I'm feel like I'm either an imposter or again, like talking with my podcast, whereas I feel like I'm being stale or something of that nature. For me, it's about, there's nothing wrong with me. I just need to get re-inspired. Honestly, a big thing that's helped me a lot is I don't even remember where I read the article, but it, there was an article like in, I don't know, it's like on HuffPost or Slate or something like that, that said they interviewed like a hundred creative CA, CEOs and stuff like that. And the successful ones that were very successful or whatever, like an overwhelming, they actually planned a part of their day where they would just think. Mm-hmm. And so... And, and not meditate, not any, but literally, and I've tried to do that. I've, and it sounds ridiculous that I make plans for that, but it is just kind of like I'll wake up and I'll have my coffee and I'll just think. Mm-hmm. I'll just think about what I want to do. I'll just think about life. I'll just, 
think and it lets my brain almost kind of shake out the marbles and shake out the crap. And often that's when I find that I get re-inspired, recommitted and remember kind of who I am. Mm -hmm. That's so important. That's it's uh, as somebody who is really, you know, type A and really has a lot of stuff going on and busy all the time, me, Um, I have to give myself those breaks. And I sometimes forget. And then I get, you know, so bogged down with like, why isn't this working? Or, you know, why isn't this coming out right? And then if I can just like go for a walk, and not have, I'm going for a walk and I'm walking as fast as I can so that I can run this errand and do this and do this and be back by this time. But if yeah. I'm just walking and thinking, or if I can wake up in the morning and have some space of time where I'm not immediately in a conversation with my partner, or I'm not immediately having to rush to go teach or something like that, having those little spaces of time where I'm just kind of processing everything and everything is kind of like settling in and swirling around in my brain is when those new ideas come or suddenly I have, oh, obviously, yes, this is the next thing that I want to do. Mm-hmm. And instead of, you know, trying to grind away at something, there's just space. Oh, yeah, for sure. I always have, I hate running, but I always have, I hate working out, period. <laughs> That's really probably my biggest struggle is, is trying to fit in physical activity. But every time I do it, at least, well, it depends on what I'm doing. But if I'm doing something like running or swimming, where it's just you're doing one thing and just kind of going, the thing I always walk away for that I always have so many ideas. Mm -hmm. So talking about getting re-inspired and your show, The Dear Maddie Show, what do you think, just like off the top of your head, if I were to ask you, what would re-inspire you in your show? Or if you could do anything with that platform and with that show next, what might it be? putting you on the spot. <laughs> no. And you know, and I fully, I need to think about it more. I fully don't know the answer to that question. I know I want to do something that I feel like I've gotten a lot of guests from being like podcast movement and stuff like that. And which have been wonderful. And when I ever, I was on Dr. Drew and Adam Carolla, a lot of people shared that. So then that got a lot of podcasters. I think that wanted to be on my show for that reason as well, which was great. And I'm, I'm really happy with the interviews. I think, too, that to know something that's creative, we think, well, if I want to change something, then that means what I did before is not good or not effective. I try not to say good and bad, but mm-hmm. there, it's hard. So I try to put it in terms of effective and not effective. Because mm-hmm. then when I look at that and say, well, my past shows, they were effective because they were effective because people reached out to me and told me they listened to them and then it affected them. I feel like a lot of times... I have a lot of times, at least now, this last year, I've had people on my podcast that we have this core value, like yourself. And this is why I appreciate you asking me like more kind of deeper questions about my life, because people that want to come on my show that either they've written the book, they have an agenda in a good way. This is who they are. They branded themselves. They're either their own podcast or their website. It's about helping people find this type of self and da da da. And that's great. But it's almost like sometimes I feel like People are coming to me with rehearsed points, really good rehearsed points, really helpful. But at the same time, I feel like sometimes I'll leave an interview, and this is more on me, not them actually, because I'll leave the interview not knowing really though who they are, what their struggle was. That's what actually I'm finding. I'm more interested, instead of talking to people out there in the ether, Mm -hmm. like my listeners, quote unquote, I'm becoming more interested in the conversation between that person and myself in that moment. And what they bring out and hearing, like I said, I really love that you were like, what do you do for money? Because a lot of people never talk about that (laughs) because they don't want to out some person as far as what they actually are that they, you know, they're working at Starbucks, but they're saying they're entrepreneur on fire, not entrepreneur on fire. I just said that, but that show, (laughs) he really is an entrepreneur. Um, Sorry, I'm not saying that. But somebody else who's pretending to be that as well, because they perceive that as, oh, that's the successful entrepreneurial podcaster. Like, that's the image I want, too. Yeah. And so I think, too, going back to how do I kind of reclaim inspiration? And this is why I love therapy. This is why I love talk shows. It's question. It's the curiosity and the question. Because I've been trying to ask my own questions of myself, but it's hard because sometimes we're just in ourselves. So the questions we ask, maybe we're trying to lead ourselves somewhere in a subconscious way we don't even know. Whereas you just ask a genuine question out of curiosity, not knowing what the answer would be, Mm -hmm. not knowing how that you were literally just saying, how are you going to get re-inspired about your podcast? And the way that you ask that 
you helped me in just this moment figure out, oh, it really is about, I need to have more interviews that are focused on, yes, we answer advice questions, but I really want to know more about the person sitting in front of me. So am I going to start having more in-person interviews or would I start changing the way I format my show a little bit so that way I actually get to the heart of what's going on with this person? So now you have me thinking, and I think that's the beauty of just questioning and having maybe a good friend who just asks good questions of you to kind of shake you up. Yeah. And I think that's one of the beauties of podcasting in general is it's an opportunity that I think sometimes gets missed by new podcasters is that they are so focused on the formula. And I know I certainly was like this when I started doing interviews and not the formula, like I read it in a book or I listened to somebody else's show and copied their questions or something like that. But They forget that this medium is so intimate and has such, even if we're not in person, even if we're on Skype right now on audio and not even looking at each other like we are. And in fact, I think when you are on audio only, it's even more intimate than when you're on video. Uh, Yeah, I agree. There's like this opportunity to, even if you don't know the person at all or only just a little bit, there's this opportunity to have some new deeper connection or some realization. And I try to have conversations that both people can think about something in a new way or have a realization or something where it's not just, you know, or if I go on somebody else's show, I love going on other people's shows. And I used to think, oh, I have to remember to mention this thing, or I have to somehow steer the conversation to this program that I'm offering or to and then I'm like, no, actually, I just need to show up and listen and answer whatever question (laughs) comes up, you know, to the best of my ability and just be my own personality. And when I could relax and not feel like I needed to prepare for podcast interviews, they became so much more enjoyable. And when I listen back to them with myself as a guest, I enjoy listening to those conversations so much more when I'm really just having a conversation about something that's that's interesting to me. Yeah, 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 totally. So Matt, What advice do you have for somebody who's listening right now and thinking, I really just want to get re-inspired in my own work? Maybe I want to try something new, or maybe I want to approach something I've been doing in a new way and make it feel authentic and feel like me and be like a joyful expression of my own creativity. What advice would you have for that person? You know, one thing that comes to mind is, get inspired by other people's success. Mm. Don't be jealous of that. That's not <laughs> yours. That's not yours to have. That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> and I really, again, I've never been a super jealous person. That's why I'm not really great at sports because I'm not competitive with other people. I'm just more with myself. But so the new Queer Eye is huge right now. And one of my very good friends is Karamo, who's on that show. And he's been on my podcast twice now. But the thing is why I'm so just happy for him is that I've been friends with him for nine years now. And I've seen how hard he worked for that, like really how hard, how he kept hustling, how he was raising two children, single dad at the time, like Mm. the jobs that he would take. That's how I met him through one of like the side odd jobs that he had that we worked some together working with LGBT youth. So when you see that and you kind of get to see the behind the scenes of this person that people think it just happens for them. And so when I say get inspired by that, like ask yourself if there's other people around you that you're admiring or you're even a little jealous of, ask yourself, what do they do to get to that? Mm -hmm. Because I think when you look at that person as a, a real person, like I think that about Ross Matthews too. A lot of people say, like Ross Matthews had a show and they said, oh, are you jealous that he had a show? And I was like, well, first of all, more than one gay man can have a talk show. Like, <laughs> please, there's not, there's room for all of us. But no, because I know his story. I have friends that know him. I remember going to the grocery store like six years ago and I see him in the grocery store line. So I think of him as this person who's really been working his ass off since he was an NBC intern to make a career out of this. So for me, that's a big thing. And I say that because sometimes it can be overwhelming to look at our own circumstance Mm -hmm. because we think, oh, I need to get re-inspired, but I've got this and I have this and I've done this show. And if I totally scratch this show and start a new type of creative endeavor, are people going to care because people see me just this way? Really look at other people that you admire. And like, I love reading artist biographies. That's always really, I honestly, a lot of times I even listen to them on Book on Take because it's usually read by the artist who wrote it. And I highly recommend that Carol Burnett's ones that I love. One of hers is great. One more time. 
That's really helpful for me. I think a lot of times when we feel overwhelmed and hopeless, looking outside of our experience. So whether that's in other people's success or volunteering for charity, volunteering at a homeless shelter for people that are in just not as good circumstances you are, that can be helpful too. So that's kind of my number one thing, kind of going outside because sometimes that can help the inside because the inside can be overwhelming. And then my secondary thing for that of how do you get re-inspired is honestly, we, we often, again, we focus on, well, what do I want to do? I have to think about what I want to do. It's almost like if you're deciding, okay, I'm hungry. I want the perfect meal. What do I want? And you're sitting there thinking about the perfect meal. However, sometimes going through the things you don't want to eat can lead you to the perfect meal. If you say, well, don't really want Mexican. I just had that the other day. We do that. This is something, we do this so naturally. We say, well, I had pizza the other day. And you kind of see all these things and you go, wait a minute, I've been at Mediterranean in a while. Yeah, that sounds good. I really want like chicken shawarma. And there you go. You've been led to your perfect meal. And so it goes the same way of, man, okay, I want to do this with the Dear Maddie show. What do I want to do? I want to have like the most amazing, like deep conversations. I think maybe what, what, I don't know. Well, then if I stopped and go, well, Okay, I don't want to have a show where I feel like people are promoting their stuff. Okay, check. I don't want to have a show where I feel like we're preaching to people and giving them advice when sometimes we don't know what we're talking about. Check. If I start to go through these things that I don't want, then it kind of clears the weeds so that way you can focus on the tree in the forest. Wow, that's awesome. So we'll be linking to all of your, speaking of promoting yourself, but (laughs) we'll be linking to all things Matt Marr in the show notes for this episode, of course. But beyond that, just in terms of our conversation and our listeners and whoever might be out there with your voice in their earbuds, is there anything else that you want to share or that you feel like you didn't say that you wish you had or? You know, oh, this, I'm so glad I do want to say this because it's, (laughs) it's important for me now is that I recommend no matter what you're doing in your life to take an improv class. Improv has Mm -hmm. saved me in so many ways because what improv is about, improv is about being in the moment. It's about instead of thinking what you're going to say next while someone's talking, it's actually listening to them and then taking what they say, literally saying yes to it and then adding to it, which is a tenet of improv. So if if Bob and Gary are doing a scene where Gary goes, said, hey, do you want to go to 7-Eleven? And Bob says, nope. Well, then the scene stops and they have to say, you have to start all over. Whereas Bob says, hey, you want to go to 7-Eleven? And then Gary, yes, ands it. And Gary says, yes, I want to go to 7-Eleven. I want to rob it. Well, now you have a scene. Mm -hmm. Now you've created a scene. And so Tina Fey wrote an article about this years ago about kind of the metaphor of improv for life. And I think it's so helpful no matter what the mother, a father, a corporate lawyer, an insurance salesman, entrepreneur, podcaster, a nurse, whatever you're doing, a teacher especially, if you're in these situations where you just want to think on your feet, but you also want to be in the moment, because when you asked me that, at first, I really didn't have anything else to say because I feel like I'm here. I'm just listening to a conversation. I don't have anything else to add because I've been listening to you and going off the questions you've asked me. And so in that moment, I thought, of, oh, no, I feel pretty good about this because I was just in the moment. And then I had this moment of gratitude for improv. So that's just what led me to say, I think, for people, wherever in your small town you can find them a lot, do it, take an improv class. Go do improv. (laughs) In my theater and acting background, I hated doing improv. But in recent years, I've come to appreciate it a lot more. So Thanks for the advice, Matt. (laughs) Matt Marr, host of the Dear Maddie Show podcast and all around delightful human being. If you happen to be a podcaster or aspiring podcaster yourself and are attending podcast movement in Philly this month, July 2018, Matt and I are both speaking. Matt's talk is Tuesday morning at 11 a.m. called Your Story is Awesome, But You're Probably Telling It Wrong. And my talk is Wednesday at 11 a.m. called Power Your Story, High School, Autism, Diverse Learning, and Podcast Mentorship. You see the connection? Both talks are about storytelling, and I think that's part of why Matt and I jive so well. I'd love to meet you at Podcast Movement, get your feedback, and maybe even interview you for my other podcast. Oh, wait, Andrea, you have another show? 
Why, yes, I do. If you are podcasting, or at least pod curious, I encourage you to check out my other podcast, Podcast Envy. Today, if you are listening to this on the day of release, July 11th, 2018, I'm starting a brand new mini series over there on that show, the great podcast crossover, Podcasting and Imposter Syndrome. My first guest in the mini series is Bree Seely of But How? And many more awesome voices are to come. Okay, circling back to Matt Marr, please check out The Dear Maddie Show. Find him on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as The Matt Marr, two T's, two R's. Links to all the things will be in the show notes for this episode at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash 072 for episode 72 and in the description for your app. But I have come to realize that not all apps display links properly. (sighs) The ongoing trials and tribulations of being an indie podcaster. So you can definitely get the links on my website. This episode was mixed by Edwin Ruiz of Mondo Machine. Our theme music is by Jovia Armstrong. I want to thank you so much for listening. And this week, I am hoping that you take some time to explore how you can re-inspire yourself and reconnect with that authentic creative spark that really is going to move you forward on your creative